，他们。Father, we thank you because you have been good to us. You have been good to us. Even when we have been faithless, you have remained faithful because you cannot deny yourself. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for everything you have been to us. And as we venture into your word, thank you because nobody is an accident. We are all here on assignment. So as we get into your word today, thank you for revelation knowledge. Thank you because the eyes of our understanding 
shall indeed be enlightened the revelation on that which you have called us to do thank you father in jesus name amen hello 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 welcome god bless you uh shermy welcome colleen great to have you bernice good evening hazel oluyomi how are you my dear Catherine, and then on, on on youtube jerry welcome kennedy hello 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 we are going to have a great time today i hope you're all ready for that we are going to have an amazing amazing time today um i was having a a session with someone earlier on today and one of the things we looked about we were talking about was uh i was looking at hi john i was looking at you know the fact that when you look across the super successful people on the planet in whatever area hi frida when you look at them one thing that you see a lot of them have in common was that they i i, I wrote it down the way the the holy ghost prompted me to say it i was so blessed i had to write it down myself even though i was the one saying it that one of the things we notice with a lot of these guys is that they stumbled on something as children and just advanced it and what i, would, I wrote down and this is very important never outgrow the creativity of childhood outgrow the foolishness but never outgrow the creativity for so i uh, in that conversation today we now began to look at the forbes list of the world's highest paid dead celebrities highest paid dead celebrities in you won't believe it in 2016 from the grave michael jackson earned 825 million dollars from the grave somebody hearing me um last year it was 115 million elvis presley last year earned a hundred million dollars these are i mean elvis especially died before i was born you know um john lennon last year and he earned 22 million marilyn monroe died before i was born last year she earned 10 million dollars and when you look at a lot of those people they grew into this so there's something god has put in you unfortunately for many people adulting takes it away from us but i believe today the good doctor is here with us the good doctor who makes a living there he is Karibu Datari, Asante. the good doctor who makes a living fixing the hearts of children. Mm -hmm. Isn't that something? Eh? That your, 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 your job is to fix the hearts of children. Isn't that something? What's it like, Datari, before we even get into this, what's it like, you know, in the hospital and you know that the, the life of that child literally is in your hands. How does that feel? Oh, by the way, he is a heart, child heart specialist, okay? So tell us more about what you do, your your, your day job and how that feels. So, so thanks, uh, Doc, for uh, inviting me. Uh, yeah, it's uh, so I do children's heart surgery here in, in Kenya. It's a very needed uh, uh, discipline. And um, 
it's both very exciting and very humbling. I think the word I'd like to say is it's very humbling. Um, I think for a person to think that they as a human hold the life of another person in their hands, I think that's, that's a misunderstanding of what happens uh, for doctors and what have you. We are just one method I think God uses to, um, you know, to, to make life better for other people. And when you have that approach, then you feel, you know, you feel humble. But then when you're doing it and you actually succeed, it's very, very exhilarating and very, very rewarding. And, you know, you, you, when you do it, it's just an amazing feel. And that's part of the things that uh, we want to talk about, that people can actually replicate that feel. You don't have to be doing heart surgery to get that feeling of complete satisfaction when you're interacting with people. So it's a, it's a wonderful thing. I, I'm humbled every time I do it. Amazing. And um, just, you know, Dr. Awari is a very humble man. He won't tell you the full story. He is the number one guy in Kenya for this, and he is the one changing the curriculum in this country on how heart surgery is being done. He's a, he's a lecturer also at the university and changing the whole curriculum. So we're really privileged to have you here today, Doc. And please, uh, we've come from far. We've been together since 1994. So we've come from very far. So, Doc, just take it away. All yours. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Doc. Uh, and good evening. Good. I'm not sure the time zones, whether it's good morning, but uh, I greet everybody. So nice to see you here. Um, I think one of the most important things about life is, is getting balance. And uh, I think everybody's you know, in this day and age, everybody's uh, trying to do something, trying to achieve something. And, you know, you're looking at your neighbor, your neighbor's doing A, B, C, D. Sometimes you feel good, you think you're ahead of your neighbor. Other times your neighbor's ahead and you feel bad. Uh, but I think what's really important is to get a, a, a context for life. Uh, and once you know what you're meant to be doing with your life, life takes a whole new dimension and it's something so wonderful. Yeah, it becomes a good life. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, <clears throat> and the, the title of the message is what to do with your life. Uh, I know it could be a cliche, uh, a cliche title, but I think it's something so critical. You only have one life. You, it just makes sense to, to do the right thing with it. Now, um, context is the most important thing. And I was actually having a discussion with my one of my sons this morning, um, and we were talking about, uh, you know, a contentious subject. Um, I, I, I get the letters mixed up sometimes, LGBTQ. And as a, as a teenager, he wanted to get some information about it. And what helped us in how to, you know, how to deal with that topic was uh, having a good compass or a good baseline, a good place to start. And then we were able to navigate our way through that uh, difficult topic. So when we look at your life, when you look at what you're meant to be doing with your life, your career, people call it purpose, people call it calling, all different names. I think the most important thing is to appreciate that there must be a start. There must be an origin of where uh, we came from as human beings. So I don't know the, the background of all the people who are, who are tuned in, uh, but I'll use, I'll use a background or I'll use a context that I found very, very helpful to me. Um, uh, it, has, it has stood the test of time. Uh, I've even looked at it from a scientific side of things, and it still proves the test of time, and, and that's the Bible. So we'll start there. I think if you don't have a baseline, you will get lost with what to do with your life. And, and there are so many people out there. I bought a book the other day. I got excited when I looked at it. I was in, 
in I think Carrefour and I walked in and I saw the title, it was a new book and it was something to do with the power of purpose. And whenever I get those kind of books, I get really excited. So, you know, I picked it. In fact, I felt God saying, pick it. And, and when I read it, uh, I was so disappointed because it talks about all the things you hear about, do, follow your passion, do what you're good at, uh, all those kinds of things. But there was no mention of God in it. And the, so there was no direction. There was no uh, foundation. So we're going to start there. Now, the Bible says that God is love. That's in the book of First John, uh, chapter 4. And it's mentioned not once, but several times. God is love. Uh, and the next scripture of interest to me is First Corinthians chapter 13, that where it says, love is not selfish. So if you add these two scriptures together, it, it tells you God is not selfish. And I, that, I think that's critical. So if you're selfish, you're only thinking about yourself. That's what selfish means. You're not thinking about the next person. You're just thinking about you or me. Uh, that's selfish. So let's imagine that God is not selfish. It's, you know, it's some time in the past or maybe even outside of time. And God is the only person in the universe or in whatever you want to call it. And he's not selfish. So the only thing that is logical is for God to create somebody else. That's the only way God could express himself. Because he's not selfish, he'd make somebody else so that he can focus on that somebody. Now, that somebody is you, that somebody is me, that somebody is every human being who has ever been, currently is, and will be. God made them so that he can focus on them. And that's what the Bible tells us. And when he's focusing on you, what does he want to do? Luke 12, 32 tells us, your heavenly father wants to share the kingdom with you. Another translation says he wants to give the kingdom to you, which is natural. You know, um, I share things with my wife. Um, initially, when we got married, I thought I was a really good guy. Uh, and, you know, I thought I was well balanced. I was not selfish. Uh, and then when I got married, I realized that I was a different guy. I was very selfish, actually. I was so used to things just for me. I had to readjust. Uh, and then I realized that, you know, there's more to life than everything being for me. So here you have God. And the natural thing is, if you're not selfish, is to share and give. And God wants to share everything he has with you, including the kingdom. And that kingdom includes uh, rulership. It includes dominion. It includes uh, controlling things. That's why Genesis said, uh, early in the book of Genesis, says, let's make human beings. Let them have dominion. The Good News Bible says, let them rule. Let them bring the earth under their control. So that's the, the context. God wants you to share rulership with him. Now, have you ever asked yourself this question? If God loves me so much or loves you so much, why isn't he here in the physical? You know, that's a question that's bothered me for quite a while because, you know, if somebody tells me that they love me, then I expect them to be with me, right? I, if my wife started telling me I love you and all this and she's never at home, I'll question that. So if God loves me so much, why is he not here? Why is Jesus not sitting with me right here in the physical? I'm not talking about in the spiritual. But why can't I just hug him uh, and feel he's here, uh, 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 you know? And it's very intentional that God is not here in the physical. Have you ever thought, have you ever had, or have you ever heard of a kingdom or a country that has two presidents? I mean, when Prince Charles, he had to wait so many years to become king, and he could only become king when his mother passed, right? So the whole concept of being a ruler, the whole concept of being in dominion, you can only be one. It's like the movie, there can only be one. Yes, you can only be one 
king or queen. You can't have two queens ruling at the same time. Then you're not a queen. By definition, a king or a queen is one. And so if God was going to share kingship or rulership with you, he can't be with you. He's not, I mean, he can't be there. Otherwise, how will you express yourself as a king? And God's not dying. He's not going anywhere. So the only thing he could do, he created a new realm. That realm is the physical realm. It's bounded by time and space. We call it the physical realm, the universe as we know it. And God was very intentional. He said, I'm not going to be there in the physical. I'm going to put mankind there in the physical. I'm going to put the spirit man inside a physical body. And that unit, which is called the soul, Remember the Bible says that God created, uh, he took dust from the ground, created a body, then he took spirit from himself and put that spirit in the body. And that unit, body and spirit, became a living soul. That's why when you hear about plane crashes and unfortunately people die, they'll say the plane went down and all souls were lost. That unit, all right? So... You know, God was very intentional. He said, I'm going to put this spirit in this body, and I want this body to control this planet Earth. And God is not there. Yes, Jesus came for a time. That's a different story. But he, God is not located physically here all the time. And that's intentional. And that's to give you and I the opportunity to rule. And that's a very important backdrop for what we are now going to discuss. So, God made you so he can share everything he has with you, and that includes rulership. And that's a very important thing to appreciate. Now, um, so if God made you, he must know the plan he has for you. It's very easy for God to say, uh, just give you instructions. You could just sit and God gives you every instruction. He can tell you, now go to the bathroom now. I think you need to go and open your bowels now. I think you need to go and do this. Go and buy this now. Go and buy a ring for your wife or go and buy this. I mean, he could do that. He knows he's got a plan. But then that wouldn't be a relationship. What God wants from us or what he'd like to... And it's not that he wa he wants to give this to us, this relationship that we can have with him. He wants you to inquire. In fact, it says that, you know, that's part of humanity's blessing is to inquire. God hides things and, and then you inquire and find out. So, you, you know, part of the excitement of life is working out what you're meant to do with your life. It involves using your mind, your thinking. It involves using, uh, you know, what you see, your senses. And it involves talking with God as you're thinking. Now, at this point, I want to say something very important. Uh, I, and this might be a bit contentious, but I just need to say it so that we are clear. Um, you, depending on what you know, which school you've gone to and which you know, which area of Christianity you've been, the, people talk about you know the the spirit, the body, and the soul. And then the, the soul is where the emotions are and what have you. But when I look at the scripture, really what seems to come out is that there's an inner man and then an outer man, right? And then the inner man, um, if you look at scripture, actually can think, all right? And and this, is, this makes sense. It says we have the mind of Christ. It, that means God has a mind. So really the spirit uh, can think. And the mind is actually uh, part of the spirit. It's not some third thing that people talk about. And this is very important. And now the brain is not the same as the mind. This is very important. And we mix this up all the time. The brain is part of your body. And so what your, what your, uh, your spirit does, your spirit, which can think, your mind interfaces with your brain. Your brain then picks up those thoughts and then tells your body what to do, right? So your body is just a piece of hardware. You know, it's, it's, it, your brain is a piece of hardware, right? So, so let's be very clear. When God talks to you, he talks to your spirit. And of course, you're, you have a mind, so, which is part of your spirit, which is where you get these ideas from when you, comp you, know, you talk to God. And then these ideas 
you know, your brain picks them up and then you get them as thoughts. And then you think, ah, I think God is telling me to do this and that. And, you know, you confirm it. I know that's a bit contentious, but I mean, it seems to be what the Bible is saying and it seems to make sense. So let's use that model to see how we work with God to understand what we're meant to do with our lives. Now, you'll hear people saying that how you know what to do with your life is just follow your passion, do what you love. Do what you're good at. And to some degree, that's good advice, to some degree. If you've grown up in an environment that's very supportive, where you have parents who have, you know, they're always supporting you, telling you, oh, well done, son, well done, my daughter. Ah, I can see you're very good at uh, doing A, B, C, D, and they keep reinforcing and telling you what you're good at. Then you'll have a positive picture of what you're good at. And the information of follow your passion, follow what you're good at can be very helpful. But if you come from a, a difficult or a different background where it was not supportive, where you're being told all the time how useless you are and how bad things are, you can't amount to anything, then it'll be very difficult to be, get a picture of really what your gifts are because you've been oppressed and suppressed all the time. So you have to be weary about that advice or follow what you're good at, follow what you love. I mean, sometimes your exposure when you are growing up is so limited that you never come across actually what you love. You're always doing things you hate and so you'll never know what you love. So when people tell you follow what you love, you really don't know because you've not been exposed. On the other hand, there's people who have had a background where they've been exposed to so many things and they've come across actually what they love. And even without consulting God or doing anything, they decided to follow what they love and, you know, they make progress with their life. So um, just early on, I'll say that old advice of follow what you love, do what you're good at, it, it, it can be limited. If you've had a good background, it's helpful, but if your background is not so good, it can be tricky. So what's a better way of doing it? Now, what I'm going to share is not unique. It's not something I've developed. Uh, it's something that I've read in, in different places and I've found it to be true. Um, you can never change who you are. Who you are always slips out one way or the other. And, and so you, you need to start asking the question, who am I? Now, how do you find out who you are? The best way of doing it is to start telling stories about yourself. So if you look back in your life to your earliest memories, maybe when you're about, you know, five or six years old, I think that's when memories start becoming coherent. It's not just flashes of pictures, but there's actually events that you can recall. Think back that far back in your life. And what I'd like you to do, and you don't have to do this now, but it's an exercise you can do over the next few days. Get a di get, get a journal somewhere where you can write down what you what, what what these stories are going to tell and the stories i'd like you to tell are think back to something you did you actually did it okay whether it's cleaning the toilet ball polishing shoes driving a car whatever it was you did it and you felt very pleased with yourself you were very satisfied at the end of doing it you felt a sense of accomplishment i've done it okay now Tell about 10 stories to yourself, okay? Through your life up to where you are now of situations where you did something and you felt very satisfied by doing it, okay? Now, tell these stories in enough detail that if you are reading out what you've written, if you are reading it out to somebody, it will take about 10 minutes to tell that particular story. It's important to have that kind of duration because the, there'll be details in that story which are important, all right? So uh, just to give you an example of the kind of stories I'm talking about, uh, when I was about oh, maybe six or seven, and my dad had uh, an old automatic watch, and I really liked it, but it was not working. So I went to him and I said, uh, Daddy, can I please have this watch? He said, sure, but it's not working. I said, I can fix it. And, and what I did was I... I, I, when we would go into the streets of Nairobi in that, in that period or during that time, there, there were a number of watchmakers and watch fixers on the streets. So as my mom was pulling me by the hand and we we're walking through the town, I would stop 
and I'd watch these guys who had the big lens in their eyes and I'd see how they were opening the watch, how they were cleaning the watch, and I would see what they were doing. Then when I got back, um, I would, I now did the same. I used the same tools I saw there as a seven-year-old. I opened the back of the watch. I cleaned the watch with paraffin and I got the watch working and I was very satisfied. So you see, that's the kind of story I've shortened it, but that's the kind of story you would want to tell. Another occasion, I did something else, like you know, a bit later in life, uh, I was I was building, for example, uh, you know, these days when you get radio controlled toy cars for your children, you buy the car already assembled and you just put batteries in and give it to the children. But in when I was a kid, you actually built these cars and they had real shock absorbers. You put, you had to connect the engines, the cogs. You had to build the gearbox, and you know, I was building that. And 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 when I built it and got the car working, I felt really good. So that's another story. So tell these stories. Now, once you've told these stories, you need to ask yourself some questions. Ask yourself all the W W questions except the why question. Ask the who. Ask the when ask the where right all these what okay who were you with when were you doing it where were you doing it how were you doing it all right now these questions or the answers to these questions they will they will tell you what your gift is this is the unique set of abilities god has given you that make you uniquely you and make you an asset wherever you go, all right? So if I, if, I, if I look at my stories, out of the 10 that I've told to myself, and you look at three, four or five of them, you'll see a recurring theme. So when I asked those questions, who were you with, for instance, I, I tended to be either myself or with a small team. What were you doing? Well, I, te I was working, I would research, I would actually read up, get information. Remember the story of me watching the, the, the guys with the, the watchmaker? So I would, I would get information, then I would use that information to, to work on something with my hands or with my mind, all right? Then, you know, when was I doing it? I determined the time when I would like to do these things. I was not being told, you go and do this now. It's me who woke up and decided I'm going to do it now. So I was in control of the time. Where was I doing it? I tended to do it in, in quiet places, uh, either in the house or in the veranda, but I wasn't out in the bush. So, you know, I could see these recurring themes. Now, when I, when I now brought these themes all together, my gift, the thing God has given me, or what I bring to the table is, I, I work in small teams, I research, and I use that knowledge to make things better, right? Or to fix things. So that's what I bring to the table. That's my gift. I research, and I use that knowledge to improve or fix things. And that's what I bring to the table. That's my gift that God has given me, all right? Now, that is an important word, gift. Now, gift is not the same as purpose. You use your gift to accomplish your purpose. Now, what is purpose? Now, in these stories, now you can answer or ask the why question. Why were you happy when you did these things? Why were you pleased with yourself when you accomplished these things? The answer to that is your purpose. So for me, when I fix things, and for example, now I'm a children's heart surgeon, and when I fix a child's heart, what makes me so happy is that the heart was broken, then it's fixed. Or it was not working well, now it's working better. So my purpose is to fix things or improve things. That's, that's my purpose. Now, if I left it like that, I could fix all kinds of things. I could be a plumber, I could be a mechanic. And actually around the house, I do those things. I'll fix things around the house, I'll fix the car, because that's, that's my purpose, that's what I do, all right? But that's not enough. That's still too broad for you to, 
maximize your life. You now need to answer another question. What is my assignment? Now, assignment narrows things down. Now, let me give you an example with a car. If you think about a motor car. So a car has wheels. It has a, you know, it has a windscreen. It has a steering wheel. It has a chair. All those parts, those are, when you bring them together, the car's gift, right, is that it has all those parts, and that's what it brings to the table. It brings all these parts, and it can transport things. Okay, when you that's that's what it brings to the table, transport. Okay, now, if you could ask that car why it's happy, I'll tell you, I've seen strange things. I've seen guys putting, uh, you know, sugar cane in the back of Lexuses, land cruisers, guys putting building blocks in the back of Mercedes Benzes. Now, look, if you ask the car whether it was happy about that, what it was doing, I bet you it was not happy. You can even see it complaining how the shocks are, you know, how the wheels are splaying, how, you know, the noise it's making when a Benz is trying to carry building blocks. No, cars were made to transport people. So if you ask the car whether it's happy, it'll tell you I'm happiest transporting people. So the gift of the car is, you know, it, it, it can transport. Its purpose is transporting people but if you left it there, that car could be used to carry you to work or it could be used to, you know, for by thugs to do armed robbery or it could be used to carry a sick person to the hospital. So there are so many things the car could be used for. So how, how do you deal with this? It needs to be assigned. You need to say this car is going to be used for carrying me and my kids to school, to work, and you've assigned that car. So it's the same with your life. Just because you've identified your purpose, you can't leave it there. Otherwise, you'll be doing all kinds of things. So how do you discover your assignment? Well, it's not difficult. When I am uh, with my students, uh, in the medical students, uh, and you know they're asking questions, they're excited about training to be doctors, when it comes to the final year, or even before that, but ideally the final year, because in the final year, they'll have been exposed to all aspects of medicine. I ask them, have you, have you in, you know, as you've been rotating through the hospital, and this is Kenyatta National Hospital, have you felt like crying when you see what you see in the hospital? Or have you felt like you're very angry with what you see in the hospital? Or have you wished somebody would do something about the sick people in the hospital? And if the answer is no to any of those questions, then I just tell them, you guys, you're not meant to be a doctor. You finish your degree, even do internship, but you need to shift away from being a doctor and go and do something else. So to to make your to find out how you are assigned, you need to answer for yourself what group of patients, or what sorry, not patients, but what group of people do I see them when I see them in a particular situation, what group of people brings out the compassion in me or brings out the annoyance about the, why they're in this situation and I'd like to improve the situation. That is how you now know you are assigned to that group of people. So let me give you an example. So if you're, let's say you, you see people and you hear stories about people and the, the stories are, you know, they, they're having problems with handling money. They're not, you know, they're not investing money properly. They're not using money properly. They're not using resources properly that are related to finances. And it makes you angry, or you get you when you hear stories of people being bankrupt uh, or poor, uh, and you feel bad. You wish somebody do something about it. That's telling you maybe you're assigned to the finance sector. So whatever purpose you have and the gifts you have, you go into that sector. All right, and that's why I was telling the medical students if they've never had that emotion, that compassion rise in them 
in that area, then they're not assigned there, okay? So that's a very important thing. So the questions you're asking is what makes you feel like crying or what makes you angry when you see people in suffering? Well, I don't want to say the word suffering because sometimes it's not suffering. So let me give an example. Uh, sometimes uh, when people, there are some people who when they see that a restaurant or food is not just not being delivered the right way, maybe it's takeout and it's not coming at the right time, Maybe the presentation is not correct, or maybe you're in a restaurant and the way the food is put on the plate, it's just annoying you how it's been put. You wished it could be put properly, better. Uh, maybe the, the way it's cooked, maybe that's telling you you should be in the restaurant industry. Uh, you, you're getting where I'm coming from. So the emotion, the situation where you find another human being and it pulls out the emotions in that's telling you you're assigned in that direction. Maybe you're a musician and you're just saying this music is just not, it's not coming out the way it should. They're, they're trying to do it, but it, if only somebody could play it in a, or produce it in a different way, maybe you're then assigned to the, to the music industry. So it goes on and on. So let me just tie it all together for, in my case, so that you see how, how precisely it can happen. So you're telling these stories, you're writing them down, you're, you're praying about it, uh, and the stories are coming clearly. You've looked at maybe four or five of your 10 stories, and you're seeing a pattern emerge. So now you know your gift, and, uh, and then you ask those questions, and then you know your purpose. Then you're asking, where, does, where is emotion stirred? So you know who you're assigned to. So for me, when I told these stories about myself, the pattern that was coming out was I was in small groups, I was uh, researching things, and I was fixing things or improving them. And, and it really made me feel good when I fixed something. Uh, and so I knew now that my, whatever gifts I had, I had to use them to fix things or improve them. Now, where was the emotion coming out? Now, whenever I saw human bodies suffer you know people with human bodies that are not working well either they have a, a short leg or, or a big head or they are you know their, their spine is curved i would feel bad or if they've been burnt even when i'm watching movies i couldn't see if there's a scene where somebody's going to be shot or you know somebody's being beaten up and they're you know they're bleeding from the face i just it i just felt bad you know, and whenever I see sick people, I feel bad about it. I wish somebody would do something about it. Now, when I interrogate the emotions further, it's particularly for sick children. I really feel about bad about it for, for you know, for sick children. Now, so are you seeing now? I'm beginning to see where I want to use my gifts. I, I work, I do research, I work with my hands to fix things. And I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, I'm drawn to people who, who are sick. So, so now I'm gonna use my gifts to help sick people. Now there's another last question, which um, I've brought it last because it's not always easy to answer, but it's a helpful question. Um, by the time you're an adult, you will, usually have been exposed to quite a lot of things. So you should be able to answer the question of what interests you, what, you know, what captures your attention, what, when you are involved in it, you'll even forget to go and eat food if you're called for food or, or do something that's, you, that, that's necessary for survival. The, the interest is so strong that those basic urges, they even forget about them, even forget that time is there. So find out what interests you to that degree. For me, when I told myself the stories and looked at my life, I remember as a six-year-old boy, I was watching a show called Living Tomorrow on, on TV. And uh, during that show, they actually showed a, a beating heart. So somebody's chest was open and you could see the heart beating. And when I saw that, everything went in slow motion. Everything else disappeared. I could just see the heart. It was the sound was in my ears. I was captivated. The interest was in the heart. Then, when I'm in in school, when they're talking about 
you know, plants and uh, other subjects. I'm not so interested. When they talk about the cardiovascular system, I'm very interested. Back to medical school. When we are, you know, in, in medical school, you dissect the human body so you learn the anatomy. All the other systems were not so interesting, but the heart, very interesting. So now let me tie this whole thing together. I have these gifts where, you know, I work in small teams, I research, and then I use that knowledge to solve problems, fix and uh, make things better. Then when I do that, when I fix and make things better, I'm happy because something was broken, now it's fixed. So my purpose is fixing things. So I use those gifts to fix things. My Where I feel emotionally connected is when I see sick people, I wish somebody would do something about it, uh, particularly sick children. So, But then my interest is in, in the heart. So what do I do? Uh, well, I could only be a children's husband, which is what I'm doing now. You get it? Uh, and it's that simple. That's how you 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 find out where you're going. But of course, it's a prayerful exercise, and you have to be very honest about it, right? At one point, I thought I could be, you know, I was. I thought maybe I I should run for politics, okay? But then when I looked at my gifts, hang on, I I, I mainly function in small groups. Now, which which president or which politician will function <laughs> in small groups? They deal with nations. So I just had to be real and say, no, I can't be the president. You see, so you have to be sincere with yourself. You can't be romantic about things. You have to be real. What, what gifts do you have? All right. Now, the last thing I'll say, then we're done, is your, your assignment, it doesn't change. It doesn't change. And this is an important point. It doesn't change. But the role you play in that assignment may change. So let me give you an example. I haven't spoken to somebody like Ronaldo, the soccer player, or Messi. But uh, I guess if I was to ask them, um, you know, what they feel their purpose is, it has something to do with soccer. And it has something to do with maybe making people feel nice through soccer. Um, there's a gentleman, I've forgotten his name, he's the guy who, the, 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 the guy, there's a movie called Chariots of Fire about the runner who, uh, I think he ran the first sub four minute mile or something. And, and what he said was, he said, I love to run, I love the speed. And when I'm running, I feel th that God is thrilled. Right, so you see, he that 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 guy, as he's doing his thing, he's he feels that God is thrilled by him expressing his gift. And how many of us have watched our runners, that's Kenyan runners, uh, you know, doing their business or any uh, athlete, whether you know, I remember watching Mike Tyson when he was boxing. I mean, it was amazing how he would do business. Uh, and I like rugby, and uh, there's the, a, a guy called the late Jonah Lomu. He was a big guy, fast, and when he goes crashing through guys, you say, wow, oh, I tell you, God makes amazing people. You know, so it, as your gift is happening, it's, it's making people feel better. So let's use a soccer player as an example. When you're a young person, you can actually be the soccer player. You can be the one running around the pitch, making people happy with your skills. Uh, and soccer is the, the medium you're using. Then as you get older, you, 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 know, you can't run around as fast. Like I like playing rugby. I used to play rugby uh, at, at the university uh, and I like playing it. And uh, as a young man, you, you play it. You can run fast, you, you take the hits, you give hits and it's wonderful. Now, I remember years later when I was about 40 and I was finishing my heart surgery training in New Zealand. And, you know, New Zealand is the home of rugby, the All Blacks. So, you know, uh, my wife was telling the boys, you know, your dad, uh, he, we were having a discussion on, on, on rugby. And at that point, the plumber who was working on our sink said, yeah, we, there's a rug, there's a, we have a rugby game for over 40s. Come and play. 
And of course, you know, the boys wanted to see me play. And of course, so my pride checked in and I said, fine, I'll come and play. But you know, uh, I was 40. I used to play rugby in my early 20s. Uh, but I thought I could still run. So we went downtown. I bought kit. I bought, uh, you know, rugby boots. And I looked, uh, I looked like I could play rugby. Now on the pitch, I still thought I could play rugby. And I was actually chasing one of the guy, you know, one of the other team members with a view of tackling him. And I didn't get him. And I overheard one of my sons saying to my wife, Mommy, how come dad is not running? And you know what? I thought I was sprinting at full speed, but my son thought I was not running. So there is a stage where uh, even if I love the game, I can't, I can't participate on the field. But that's not the end of rugby. So let's go back to the soccer player. So you know by the age of 35, these guys retire they, from active sport. But if they've been assigned to bring joy to people through football, or soccer, then now they can go and be a coach. All right. So they are still the assignment is still bringing joy to people through uh, soccer, but the role has changed. They're not on the pitch now. They they are coaching, and when coaching is done, you can go to manage the team, and when managing the team is done, you can own the team. So your role is changing. Okay, but the assignment is the same. So that is what I wanted to bring out to, to us this evening, that you have to make this distinction between your gifts, you want to make, uh, and your purpose and your assignment. Uh, you need to basically be solving problems for people. That is what life is all about. Uh, when God says he wants you to rule the planet, he wants you to rule an area where you're making a difference and you're using your gifts to make life better for people. Now, for being a doctor, it's 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 obvious. Somebody's sick, you want to make them better. But you could be a musician. You know, when when I want to listen to some jazz, it's jazz I want to listen to, not reggae. So the jazz artist solves my problem, right? When when I want to go swimming, I don't want to go skiing, right? So the guy who built the swimming pool has solved my problem, right? So. So it doesn't have to be as as deep and dramatic as you know being a dealing with sick uh, people or or being a soldier or you know things that are really heavy in terms of people potentially could die or not. But when somebody is hungry and they feel like KFC, KFC has solved the problem. All right. When they're feeling like something else, pizza, pizza solve a problem. When they're feeling like fish and ugali, that has solved a problem. So you need to think like that. And I'll tell you this. When you are in your area of assignment, it draws the resources necessary. It may not look like the resources, but I'll tell you, those resources come. So if you trust the Lord that he's actually got an assignment for you, you trust him that as you've answered these questions, you go into that area, whether it's business, whatever, architecture, whatever it is, you'll find that those resources will come and your life will not be the same again. It will be exciting every day. You won't, you, you'll wake up ready to, to do some great things. And so that's what I wanted to share with you, with you guys today. I hope it's been really helpful. I've written a book specifically to guide and give more details about the things, you know, how you build your team, how you choose the guys who will work with you, because these things are important and nothing great has been done outside uh, uh, teams. You can't do things alone. So I've, I've written a book called I Am the Meaning of Life. And you can get it on Amazon, and and uh, and that can be very helpful because it talks more about the things we've talked about. So I think with that, uh, over to you, Doc. Thank you for giving me time to share that. Amazing, amazing, amazing. Well done, well done. Wow. Praise God. This was really, really good. You know, as you were talking, I remember that as a kid, you know, um, I was always, you know, my mom said, I'll take a pen 
and it would be a microphone. I, everything was a microphone for me. You know, I was always speaking and writing. Can you imagine? And I remember one of my teachers prophesied. I was uh, seven years old, and um, we had an essay writing competition. And um, I had done well. And my, my teacher said, at the rate you are going, if you keep writing like this, one day you might you just might get paid to write. Can you believe that? So, guys, I'm not going to add anything to this. I believe you all got it. Thank you so much, Doc, for coming and making it so simple for us. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, that's it for today. I just want one or two announcements. On Saturday, Saturday the 13th at 9 p.m., you know, our normal time, Kenyan time, 9 p.m., we're going to have a phenomenal session where I'm going to be literally sharing with you the next phase and you know where we are going so you don't want to miss that you don't want to miss that at all and um yeah spe spe specifically for our partners and friends so please feel free to come you can have you know those who believe in this ministry that you know of get them here also and uh, we'll have a great time together that will be 9 p.m. 9 p.m. Kenyan time on Saturday the 13th. And yes, Dr. Awori will be coming back. Uh, yes, absolutely. All right. Fantastic. All right. So that's it for today. Ladies and gentlemen, as always, we want to thank you all. We want to particularly thank our partners for your continued support. And for what you are making happen, God who sees in secret will honor you and will bless you in public in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Thank you so much. We shall see you on Thursday when we will continue our conversation on vision. And on the, on the YouTube, King, Kingdom Culture on YouTube, uh, Susan told me that I had to do the each topic as a playlist. So we've done the one for vision right now. So that way you can start from one and just watch it right through. So take advantage of that. So God bless and keep whatever you do, keep giving, keep speaking, keep praising, and keep winning. God bless you. Bye-bye.